So we've seen some momentous events, haven't we, in the country that we live in. The vote on the 23rd of June shook the whole world. 51.9% of the British public voted to leave the European Union. David Cameron resigned and we've seen shockwaves throughout all the other political parties. It was described by the Times as the Brexit earthquake. Against all the odds, against big business, against big politicians, the British people have defied them all and decided to separate from Europe. Now, although this came as a surprise to, to many people and commentators, for most Christadelphians who study Bible prophecy, this hasn't actually been much of a surprise. Because we believe that in the words of the Bible, there is an indication that Britain would separate from the European powers all along. And this evening, God willing, we hope to, to give you an outline of why that that's the case. And we're going to get there to, 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 to Britain in just a moment. But I just want to kind of lay down a few principles, particularly if we've we're not that familiar with the Bible and the scope of its amazing prophecies that we find within it. The first principle we want to, to set out is that God is in control. We read in Daniel 4 that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom, kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basis of men. And we read in Romans 13 that there is no power but of God and that the powers that be are ordained or set up by God. So although man thinks he governs this world, although he thinks he's in control, although he thinks democracy and humanism is the way that controls things, in reality, the Bible tells us something very different. The Bible says, no, no, no. God is actually in control. Now, for that reason, the Christadelphians, we're not political. We uh, give ourselves over to the will of God and we accept God's will, particularly when it comes to political decisions. Because what we're looking for is what the Bible teaches, which is about a coming kingdom on the earth. We believe that God is in control of the affairs of this earth and is bringing about a situation outlined in the Bible which will see the Lord Jesus Christ return and establish God's kingdom. Now we want to just bear with me as I, as I try and show you this from the pages of scripture and then we're going to dive into a bit more detail around Brexit. So what I'd like to do is, is to get you to turn up Daniel chapter 2. We're actually only going to, to look at a couple of passages in detail this evening. The rest of the passages will be up on, on the screen. But if you can find Daniel chapter 2, that would be really, really helpful. Because in Daniel chapter 2, we have an amazing prophecy, astounding prophecy, that sets out human history from the time of Babylon, around 600 BC, right up to our time and beyond. And in particular, in relation to what is called the kingdom of men. And if you get time when you get home, it's a good idea to read the whole of Daniel chapter 2. It will blow your mind. Um, but the thing that we're just going to do is just going to give you a sketch, a bit of an outline of what happens. Because we have Daniel, who is a prophet of God, a faithful man, and he's a captive in Babylon. And to cut a long story short, he is an interpreter of dreams from God. And the king at the time is a king called King Nebuchadnezzar. And this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he has uh, an astonishing dream. And this is basically what he dreams, and we read of this in verses 31 through to 35, he sees a statue of, of, of metals. It's got a head of gold, it's got a chest and arms of silver, it's got a belly and thighs of brass, it's got two legs of iron, and then it's got feet of iron and clay. And as the king watches the statue, a stone comes and smashes the image on the feet, and grinds it all to powder, and then this stone grows to fill the whole earth. And we think, what a peculiar, what a strange thing for the Bible to record. And there was something special about this dream. The king, he wants to understand what it is. He calls in all his, um, 
wise people, his Chaldeans they're called. <coughs> and he, um, he demands that they not only tell him what the dream was, but also what the interpretation also was. And of course they can't do it. Uh, but Daniel, who is a trainee in the in, uh, trainee Chaldean, as it were, he's given the answer by God. And so we read of it in verse 36. If you've got your Bibles open in Daniel chapter 2, just have a quick look at verse 36. We read, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So the first thing we learn is that the metals and particularly the head of gold, it symbolizes something. It symbolizes Nebuchadnezzar's reign, the Babylonian reign. So he's the head of gold. But then we read that this, this image is actually uh, a bit of a timeline. We call it a continuous historic timeline because we read, next read in verse 39 that after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and then another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now history tells us that it was the Medo-Persian Empire that attacked and took over from the Babylonians, literally taking all the power that the Babylonians had and, 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 and exhuming it, as it were, into their own, um, their own power base. And they ruled from around BC 500 to around BC 300. And then after them, history again tells us, suitably the brass, that the Greeks appeared on the world scene. And under Alexander the Great, they swept across the world. Um, the known world then, and they took over, they literally took the capital of the Medo-Persian Empire, and so the Greeks established their rule from around BC 300 to BC 28. This prophecy is astounding, isn't it? doesn't end there, though. There's these legs of iron. We read in verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. What a fitting description of the next empire that came along, which was, of course, the Roman Empire, known for its iron-clad military. But perhaps what is even more remarkable is that the prophecy tells us that, that no one singular kingdom is then going to take over from the power of Rome. Because we read in, in verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, <clears throat> for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So we're, what we're told is that there is no fifth kingdom that will take completely over the power of Rome. Instead, we're told that the, the fourth kingdom would disintegrate. And we know that this happened because in the eastern side of the Roman Empire, we know that the Ottomans came and eventually eroded and took over that side. And in the western side of the Roman Empire, we know that what happened eventually was that all of the, the tribes that were around, they took over from the Romans. And the, and the whole kingdom of Rome was split up into these different power uh, strong and weak nations, which has kind of we've inherited down through time today. So perhaps this uh, map also helps to explain that this situation. So we have the Babylonian Empire, which gave way to the Medo-Persian Empire, which gave way to the Greek Empire, which gave way to the Roman Empire, and then finally the nations of today split, some weak and some strong. Now just stop and take that in just for a moment. This prophecy is, is, is unrivaled in religious text, I would suggest to you. The Quran does not have prophecies like we have in the Bible. The Buddhist texts are nothing like this. The Bible stands alone in terms of the power of its Bible prophecies. So we have this concept of a, almost like a timeline going down through time. But what happens next in the prophecy? Well, we read of a stone 
that comes and it smites the image. Where does it smite it? On the feet. Now, if this is a timeline, we are living in the feet phase. And so this stone is something that we would expect to happen in the phase when all the nations are divided up. And what does this stone do? Well, it brings about the destruction of the image and it also is the catalyst for the mountain that eventually would fill the whole earth. And we believe that that stone is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would we say such a thing? Well, because I believe there's this passage here, for example, in Matthew 21, where the Lord Jesus Christ, in effect, tells us this. Because he says to the Jews of his day, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. And he's talking there of himself. He's saying, you're going to reject me, and I'm the stone, but I'm going to become the chief stone in, in a new building. And then look what he adds. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And we read of that grinding to powder in um, verse 35, where we read in Daniel chapter 2 that the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold will be broken to pieces together and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind car carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so we get the idea, don't we, of a completely new regime, a completely new way of doing things, headed up by the Lord Jesus Christ. And importantly, my dear friends, unlike the churches around that teach that our hope is in heaven, <clears throat> what the Bible is telling us is, that this kingdom is to be on the earth because this stone that grows to fill the earth does so on top of the ruins, as it were, of the kingdom of men. And so we expect the Lord Jesus Christ, that stone, to return to establish that kingdom. And when we come to the Bible and we have that in mind, we find that this is all the way through our scriptures. You know, Jesus, when he... When he, after he died and was raised from the dead, he went up to heaven to be at the right hand of God, the Father. And as he ascended, we, we read in Acts chapter 1 that, that two angels appeared and said to the men of Galilee who were looking up as Jesus ascended, and they said to him, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So Jesus is going to return to the earth. And this mountain that is going to be set up is going to be God's kingdom. We read, didn't we? In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's what the mountain was that would fill the whole earth. And this theme of the kingdom is so important to understand as we go through scripture this is what the angel Gabriel said to Mary. You may remember it from um, nativity plays you might have attended. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, the angel says about Jesus, who was about to be born, that he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's a kingdom. So God's going to give Jesus a throne. Specifically, not just any old throne, specifically the throne of his father David. And when we go back through our scriptures, we find that there was an actual kingdom that David ruled over, the kingdom of Israel in the past. And the throne of David was found in Jerusalem. And this kingdom had laws, and it had governor, uh, you know, the king, the ruler, and it had people, and it was on the earth. And the angel says that Jesus is going to be the one to re-establish that kingdom of David. And we could say a lot more about that, but just keep those things in mind as we go through. And as we say, this principle, the, this, this lesson, this teaching of the kingdom, it's all the way through scripture. We read in Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead, that means the living and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. 
So he's going to appear and there's going to be a judgment and he's going to do that at his appearing in his kingdom. It's a future event. And the Lord Jesus Christ even taught his followers to pray to God. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now you're thinking, well, I've come to a talk about Brexit. What's this got to do with, with Britain leaving Europe? But I wanted to just get that across so that we, we all see that God has a plan, has a purpose. And it's not just wishful thinking. We've got the backing of Daniel chapter 2 for assurance. But I just want to point out one little detail from Daniel 2 before we, we have a look a bit more about this question of Britain. Have a look at verse 29 of Daniel chapter 2. It says, this is what Daniel says before the king, just before he gives the interpretation. Oh, sorry, verse 28. We read, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon my bed are these. And then in verse 29, we read, as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon my bed. What shall come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. So that night, before Nebuchadnezzar went to bed, he was thinking, what's going to happen to my great empire? What's going to happen to the great things that I've done? And the prophet Daniel says, these things are going to happen specifically in a time period called the latter days. So it's all going to end in the latter days. That's the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar would have learned from this dream that he had. Now, with that in mind, let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 38 that we had read for us just a moment ago. Now, Ezekiel chapter 38 gives us some of the details, a snapshot, as it were, of the nations and what they're doing just before the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, just before God acts. And specifically, we are told that Ezekiel 38 is also a prophecy about the latter days. So have a quick look, for example, in um, verse 8, it says, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. And in verse 16, it says, halfway through, it shall be in the latter days. So we're, we're on the same page, as it were, uh, the, the two prophecies are harmonious. What happens in Daniel 2 is that the stone comes, smites the image and establishes God's kingdom. That's in the latter days. And we're told here in Ezekiel 38 that the events of this prophecy also happen in the latter days. And this is our time period. We're given some clues that this is the case. Because we read in verse 8 that this is the time when the land, the land of Israel, is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. And this, this army comes against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And again, in, in verse 12, we read that this army comes, the, the, this is what this prophecy is about, an invasion. And they come to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn their hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. In other words, Ezekiel is prophesying that, that when the Jewish nation has returned and been restored to their land, that this event, the events here take place, called the latter days. And we're given a couple of other quick uh, Quick signs that this is controversy, specifically on the mountains of Israel. And isn't it interesting that in our time period, one of the most controversial political subjects is, of course, the settlements in the West Bank area. And we're told in verse 12 that this invading army comes to take a spoil. So you would expect that the Jews that have been regathered are, are, are somehow wealthy. And it is significant, therefore, the wealth that is being generated by the nation of Israel after they have indeed been restored since 1948, finding these, these gas fields and amongst other amazing um, economic booms that they're, that they're going through. 
But why, why this is interesting is that Ezekiel 38 is, is, is talking to us about this great invasion. And we want to just take a note of the nations involved. Now, we read in verse 2 of this mysterious character that the prophecy is, is given to. It says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog. And the Hebrew reads, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. And prophesy concerning him. Now, we haven't got time, unfortunately, this evening to give you all the evidence for who these ancient nations are and who they became as time has gone on since Ezekiel's day. But on the screen, we've given you some indication, particularly interestingly, is, is this concept of Rosh, because that's the ancient um, name of the people of Russia, the Rus, as it was translated in the Septuagint version around 200 BC. The Rus eventually became Russians. They founded the Belarus, Belarus, and the Ukrainian nations. And so specifically we're being told that there is this confederacy of nations headed up by the Russian power. And we're also told um, that there are other nations that join there with them. For example, in verse 5 we read of, of Persia, which is obviously Iran. Ethiopia and Libya, which are North African territories. Some of those are, are quite familiar names to us even today. And then in verse 6 we read, interestingly, about this chap called Goma and all his bands. And Goma and Magog, which was mentioned in verse 2, are European powers. And all of these nations, we're told, they come against God's people of Israel. And it's at that time, we read in our chapter, for example, in verse 18, it says that the fury at the end of verse 18 will come up in God's face. God acts. He cannot tolerate this invasion of his people. In other passages, we read, for example, in Zechariah 12 of this time, and we read, that it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. So God acts and one who bears God's name is looked upon. Who the Jews pierced. I wonder who that is. Well we're told in John 19 verse 37 that that is none other. That passage refers to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, John 19, 37. So for this to take place, for Ezekiel 38 to take place, the Jews have to be regathered to their land, don't they? That's point number one. And how amazing is it that that has taken place? Now, we've made the point that as part of this confederacy, there are European powers. And it's interesting that we believe that Britain will be separate from these European powers. And I'll come to that in just a minute. It actually puzzled Christadelphians quite a bit that Britain had joined the EU. But since the time um, that Christadelphian, uh, that time that, that, that Britain joined the EU, many Christadelphians have been suggesting that Britain would leave. There's just a snippet of some, uh, some uh, literature on, on the screen there. We could have put loads more. Notably, interestingly, uh, a chap called John Thomas, who founded the Christadelphian community, wrote in an Elpis Israel that he expected the, the British power to be very separate from the European powers right back in 1848. And since then, particularly this one here, you can see um, Paul Billington in 1990 stated, Britain's exit from Europe is inevitable. In milestones in 1981, going back, you know, um, a man called Graham Pierce wrote, Britain will separate from Europe. And so the, the Christadelphian community, most of, most of those in, involved in, in prophetic studies, have suggested for some time that Britain wouldn't be part of that confederacy of nations that come against Israel in Ezekiel chapter 38. Why is that? 
Well, it comes down to the identity of Tarshish, which is mentioned in verse 13. Because although we have this invading power block of nations that we've described, in verse 13 we have another set of nations, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So we have here a second power block of nations who challenge and ask the question, why, why have you come to take a spoil? They are separate from the invading force. That is the point. They have a different military, political and trading policy. They're separate. Now, Sheba and Dedan, it's very easily established from history, are found in the area of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. It's pretty much indisputed that that's the territory that they came from. So the peoples of the Gulf are there. They challenge this invading force. But what of this mysterious nation of Tarshish? Now, we're not told in the Bible specifically who Tarshish is. We don't get a verse, unfortunately, that says Tarshish is Britain. It's not as easy as that. It's an ancient name, and it's not massively um, clear. But we are given specific clues as to who the Tarshish power might be. And so when we go through these clues, we find that the only nation that really fits is the nation of Britain. Now, we... Unfortunately for time, we can't go through all the detail. But just take these, and there's eight clues that we're going to put on the screen and, and bear them in mind. But Tarshish is a people that descended from Japheth, who's a, an ancient um, man in the time of Genesis. And we're told in Genesis 10, it is an island or coastal power that he eventually established. We're told throughout the scriptures that Tarshish was a well-known maritime power. Not a great military power, a well-known maritime power. In ancient times, specifically around the time of, of Solomon, around 900 BC, we're told that, um, at the time of David as well, we're told that they traded in markets all over the world, this Tarshish power did, and specifically with India, because some of the goods that they traded were native to India, and also Africa, actually. We're told in, in, um, in the Bible as well that this place called Tarshish was located to the far west of Israel because we're told that Jonah, he goes to the western side of Israel and boards a ship to go to Tarshish, which indicates that Tarshish was to the west of Israel. I've got four more, so bear with me. We are told in Ezekiel 27 that one of the commodities that this trading power traded in was, was tin, as well as silver, iron, and lead. So this nation was, was all about metals. It, it traded in metals mainly. And what's very interesting is how rare it is to find all four of those metals in one place on the planet. Britain is, is one of them. We're told that Tarshish was to replace Phoenician Tyre as the world's trading power in Isaiah chapter 23. Tyre was this great city of trade and commerce and because of their detachment from the things of Israel, God proclaims that they will be destroyed. And in so doing, in that prophecy in Isaiah 23, we're told that they would pass over and eventually find their way to Tyre. Uh, to Tarshish these people. So whoever Tarshish is, we would expect to see the example of them taking over the world's trade. And of course, Britain has certainly been known for that, particularly with its um, involvement in the East India Company. Now, um, as we look at the prophetic side of things, we've read in Ezekiel chapter 38 that Tarshish is there with all the young lions... And it's very interesting that that gives us the impression that the Tarshish political power had 
offspring that was independent of its original mother lion, so to speak. And so we expect whoever Tarshish is to have political offspring that's independent of it. And finally, the final clue is that during the latter days, we are told that it is to be a trading power because it's there in verse 13. They are merchants and they are trading with Sheba and Dedan, the Gulf states, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13. Now, as I say, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go through all of the evidence for that. Um, but a bit of a shameless plug for a little booklet I, I've written on some of the detail in there. You can get it from Amazon, um, which does go through uh, some of those things. And I believe there that uh, Angela has some, um, oh, and you can ask her for some uh, through maybe Brother Wes uh, later on if you're interested in getting hold of, of that booklet. I will just mention one key piece of external evidence as well. This I find very interesting. This is um, an inscription by the king of Assyria around 600, uh, 700 BC. He was contemporary, pretty much contemporary with Ezekiel. So Ezekiel's writing about Tarshish. Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, he also writes about Tarshish, obviously in a completely different way. But he says, all the kings from the lands surrounded by sea, for the, from the country Ladanana, which we believe is Cyprus, and Laman, which we believe is the Ionian Islands near Greece, as far as Tarshish, bow to my feet. Now why that's interesting is we have an example there of a man who lived at the time of Ezekiel, who knew about Tarshish, it's not like the Bible's made this up, and he's saying, look, Tarshish was a land surrounded by sea. In other words, Tarshish was an island. And we're also told that it was to the far west, because if you look at his mindset here, he starts at Cyprus, he goes to the Ionian Islands, and then he says, as far as Tarshish. And you can't get any more of a western island from the Mediterranean um, and out through into the Atlantic than, than Britain. So we get that kind of indication. There's loads more. Get the book. You'll, you'll find, hopefully, it quite interesting. So with that in mind, we believe that we can pencil in the Tarshish power into our map. None other than Britain, trading in the area of Sheba and Dedan, the Gulf states. Now, if that's right, then what this is telling us, what the Bible is telling us is that the British power is separate from the European powers at the time when Jesus Christ returns to the earth to establish God's kingdom. So for us, we weren't surprised when we heard about the Brexit vote. In fact, we were quite excited, not because of the turmoil that it will inevitably cause in the nation around us, but we were excited because we see the pieces of the prophetic jigsaw puzzle coming to pass. For us, it's a great sign of the times that Indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to the earth. And it's another sign that God is in control of human affairs. And he has set out for those that want to see it from his word, a great um, sign for us to encourage us. And so the title of our talk this evening is Brexit and the Bible. What next? This afternoon, I should say. It's not evening. Everyone look to the clock then. No, I've not gone on that long. What next? So from these things, what we can gather is that the Tarshish power is to strengthen its trade ties with the Gulf. And we find loads of, loads of that happening, particularly after Brexit. We would imagine the British power would look to its Commonwealth allies and already it's got a lot of good ties, trade ties with the Gulf. We would expect that the European powers would to integrate, in, in, integrate further and obtain a common political and military will. And we're seeing that with the European um, project as it continues on. Without Britain there, it's more likely, isn't it, that that will take place. We then see something that's quite sort of strange maybe to us at first. Because if we are right and Rosh is Russia here in Ezekiel chapter 38, then we would expect the Russian power to take a lead in European affairs. And we look at the news recently, I think it was just yesterday, 
And they're putting sanctions on Russia. And we're thinking, oh, hang on, that doesn't seem to fit. But just wait there, I'll show you some stuff in a minute, which is very, very interesting. That relationship is set to change. We next would expect that eventually a terrible war will take place centered on Jerusalem and that the Lord Jesus Christ would intervene in that war and establish God's kingdom. Now you think that's crazy, you think that's wild, you think this maybe this idea of, of a worldwide war, Armageddon, is a bit far-fetched. Well, just consider some of the news headlines recently. We had before um, the Brexit vote, the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, Remain campaign, Project Gloom and Doom, wasn't it called, in the media. But maybe there's something about this. David Cameron says Brexit could trigger World War III on the 9th of May. After the Brexit vote, this is what Fortune reported, Brexit could open the door to Russia joining the EU. Fascinating. Fascinating, isn't it? Here's another one. Post-Brexit world, could Russia, Germany and France join forces? This is by Sputnik and they comment, Europe's destination in the post-Brexit world is unknown, but there has been no lack of alternative solutions and suggestions on what could happen next. One of these alternatives includes an alliance comprising Russia, Germany and France. That is Roche, that is Mago and that is Goma of Ezekiel chapter 38. Fascinating stuff. And what about this German, I can't say that, Bundestag, to vote on creating security collective, including Russia. An alternative to NATO is being put forward in Germany. The resolution seen by Sputnik was drafted earlier this month. It calls on Germany to choose the course in foreign policy aimed at dissolution of NATO and replacing it with a system of mutual collective security in Europe that will include the Russian Federation. So things can change. We've seen it, haven't we, with the Brexit vote. Things can change very quickly. God's word has been true before. We've had four worldwide empires. And now we are seeing these things come to pass that we've all, as Christadelphians, been looking for. And we find comfort, though, and assurance. That whereas others outside who don't believe in the Bible find these things distressing, that we have the comfort that the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. But what happens to Tarshish after the kingdom has been set up? The word of God has, has a number of things to say. Just, just a couple of things. Let's just go over to Psalm, chapter, Psalm 72. Now Psalm 72 is a wonderful psalm written at the time of David, but it is a coronation psalm for the king of Israel. Remember we were saying that the, the destiny of the Lord Jesus Christ is to come and sit on the throne of his father David. And we have in Psalm 72 the coronation psalm that will be sung, I believe, at that day. It's not yet fulfilled. We can tell it's not fulfilled because in verse 11 it says that all kings shall fall down before him and all nations shall serve him. That's never happened to the king of Israel, has it? And in verse 17, it says that his name, this king's name, shall endure forever. And his name shall be continued as long as the sun. And men shall be blessed in him and all nations shall call him blessed. That's never happened. It's a future prophecy, Psalm 72, of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look at it, it's fascinating. We have a righteous king, Jesus Christ, on the throne. We read in verse 8 that his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. And that phrase, the ends of the earth, is very interesting because it includes the Gentile nations. It includes the globe. It includes the whole world. It is a worldwide dominion. <coughs> we read in verse 16 that it will be a prosperous and fruitful earth. And so as that stone grows to fill the whole earth, benefits will come to those nations who accept Christ as their king. And we've already said in verse 17, this ruler is going to be immortal because his name will continue forever. And look who's there. 
in the kingdom age, in verse 10, bowing down to the Lord Jesus Christ, the kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. So the destiny of this nation that we live in now is to, to change. At the moment, it's serving itself. It's serving humanism. It's serving man. But somehow, we don't know how, the attitude of this nation around us is going to change so that they accept the Lord Jesus Christ in that day and they offer gifts to him. Now, we haven't got time to go into these other passages, but in Isaiah 2, we have another latter-day prophecy. And we're told in Isaiah 2 that the Tarshish power is to be humbled. In Isaiah 60, we read of the result of that humbling. We read of the glory of Israel and the kingdom, and we read that Tarshish is one of the nations that helps to bring the Jews back to Israel after that great war of Armageddon as a gift to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, my dear friends, what we're being told very, very clearly from God's word is that the kingdom is coming. And this hope of the kingdom was core to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew 4 that he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. And we're told in Mark 16, he tells his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and that he that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. A core part of a gospel message, sadly not taught by mainstream Christianity around us. They've moved away from the true teaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And now they cannot see these wonderful things that we see in our newspapers come around before our very eyes. But notice some of the things there. To be saved, one must believe the gospel and do something about that. Publicly declare that in baptism. And so if you're not baptised yet, it's time to think about your position. The signs of the times are around us and that kingdom is surely coming. We all hope that we might be able to join with the Apostle Paul through inspiration who said this in 2 Timothy. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, because in that kingdom, we'll be part of it with the Lord Jesus Christ to help rule that kingdom with him. He says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That's the good news of the Bible. That's the hope that we as Christadelphians have. <clears throat> the hope of the gospel is to have a place in God's kingdom. So we've summarized here. To obtain a place in the kingdom, the Bible teaches you need to believe God's gospel, be baptised into the saving name of Christ and live a godly life. And if you do this, you will have a part in the resurrection from the dead and be given eternal life to live and rule with Christ in the kingdom. And so the message of this afternoon's talk is that we want to encourage you to read your Bible, to find out more about this gospel message which is attached to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. A completely different message, perhaps, to one that you might assume is in the Bible. And the logic that we want to present to you is that if those prophecies of old have come to pass, if we can see that there was no fifth empire in Daniel chapter 2, if we can see that indeed the Jewish nation against the odds has been regathered to their land, that so will the rest of the things that we've considered. And if we can see that, that Brexit has happened in accordance with what we'd expect from God's word, surely that gives us great hope that Jesus is indeed coming. And so the question for you and for me this afternoon is, are we ready? And so we thank, me, th thank you for listening to us and hope you found that interesting. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth 
and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.